Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It is so great to be with y'all, and y'all look absolutely amazing today. I understand that our heat wave is going to be over today. Is that right? It's going to be like a cool front tomorrow, or I guess tomorrow and Tuesday. It gets down into the low 90s. Y'all can get y'all's winter, <laughs> get your winter attire out. It's going to be like a cold front coming in, I'm telling you. It's so uh, It has been unreal kind of hot lately, but um, hey, I just want to take a second and and thank Kimbra, her team, for an amazing day yesterday for the Make Waves event. Oh, come on, y'all can do better than that. You don't even, you don't even have, some of y'all like, I don't know, I don't know if I'm supposed to clap for something I don't know anything about, but um, it was a great day for families to come together. They had a beautiful time. I heard from so many families what a great time they had. Thank you for your leadership, putting the team together that, that did that amazing uh, ministry to families. And I'm thankful for, for all of that. And, hey, let me just uh, say one more thing, uh, highlight with, with Earl growth track today. If you are relatively new or new to celebration, you want to find out more about us, you're not committing to uh, being here forever by coming and checking out growth track. You're going to learn more about us at growth track, get a great meal, meet some really wonderful people. And we'd love to have you to, to come to growth track today at 430. If you'll mark it on your connect card, we'll make sure we have a place for you, have a meal for you have a place for you today. So do that. We'd love for you to be a part of that. I'd love to get to meet you Meet you there. One final thing, we'll get right into the Word. Um, I, I believe you probably agree with me in saying that many decades of, of, of prayers of millions of Christians around our nation were answered this week when the Supreme Court of the United States decided to overturn Roe versus Wade. So, so I'm rejoicing with that. I'm, I'm rejoicing because I believe that it has already begun to have impact in states in, in uh, protecting the lives of, of the unborn um, in, those, in, in many, many states already. And here's where our prayer is, y'all. Our prayer is that as, as awareness has been brought to this the way that it has, um, God deals with people. He, he doesn't necessarily, um, well, let me just say it like this. God deals with people. And so what we want to pray as believers is that God would take this opportunity to cause many, many people to consider or reconsider um, their, 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 their thoughts about where they stand on the value of every human life, including the unborn. And that we want to, across our nation, uh, for there to be a, a revival of belief in the sanctity of human life, of every life. So make that your prayer as we move forward and as our nation um, um, goes through this time where, where so many things are going on in and around it is we want God to change hearts, right? Let's, let's believe for that. So the, the big idea today in our series, we're in a series called Who Do You Think You Are? It's about our identity in Christ. It's all from the book of Ephesians. We have only been in chapter one to this point. I'm going to jump all the way to chapter four today. I want you, if you haven't done it already, get your notes out of your worship guide. If you've downloaded the app, you can pull up the notes there. Follow along with me. Many ways to learn, and and we're wanting to grow in the Word today, aren't we? I said we're wanting to grow in the Word today. We're wanting to hear God's Word, let it get in our hearts, and, and change us. And that's what the Word will do every time we allow it to. So the, the, the big idea in today's message is that in Christ I am new. I, I am new. And we're going we're gonna to dig into what is the old us, what is the new us, um, what, what causes the old us to be what it is, and, and, and how do we surrender to who we are in Christ, who God made us to be. So let's dig into what is, is, is a relatively lengthy passage. We're going to mostly center around it. I've, today I've got a few other verses uh, in the second half of the message to go with it, but we're going to just take apart these verses in Ephesians chapter 4. So follow along with me in your notes or on one of the screens. Uh, We're going to read the whole passage uh, prayerfully without a whole lot of commentating from me as we read through it. You might pray to that end. Here we go. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of heart. 
they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity, but that is not the way you learned Christ. Everybody read that phrase with me. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. That's where the truth is, and, and, and we're, we'll get to that. I want to talk, but I'm not going to. Let's keep going. As the truth is in Jesus, to put off the old self. Everybody say that phrase. To put off the old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, put off the old self, put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. A whole lot there. We're going to break every bit of it out. But first, we're going to look at the old you. Why did I choose the old you before the new you? Because a few weeks ago, we took the little survey where I said, how many of you like bad news or good news first? If somebody says, I got bad news and good news, which do you want first? It had to be at least 20 to 1. You want the bad news first, right? Okay, so truthfully, this isn't necessarily bad news or good news. It just feel, it can feel bad to the flesh. Uh, but the truth is, it's God's Word. So anytime we open God's Word, it's good, it's good news, right? It's always good news to our hearts. So, uh, but you understand what you'll understand. If you don't understand what I mean, you'll understand what I mean in a minute. Um, here's, here's part of the bad news. I guess it could be called bad news. If you're not a Christian, everything I'm going to say about the, the old you... It's just you. I'm going to give you a chance to let that one digest for just a second. It's just you, right? I don't mean to be mean. I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm only going to tell you what God's Word says today. But it is just you. It is, it is the, 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 the way of thinking that, that, that was the way every one of us thought apart from Christ. Here, here's the great news is, is if you're a Christian, everything I'm getting ready to talk about is the old you. It, it's the old you. So here's what God says through Paul in verse 17. Look at it one more time with me as we talk about the old you. Now this I say and testify in the Lord. Let me pause there for a moment. Um, th Paul is, is approaching this with, I, I believe the entire, everything Paul wrote he approaches with a great deal of seriousness. His, his, his um, laying this, this, this phrase out there before us in the middle of a chapter, though he's saying what I'm about to say to you I say solemnly as in the presence of the Lord. That's, that's what he is saying. If you, if you dig a little deeper in that where he says, I, um, now this I say and testify in the Lord. It's just, he's, he's saying th as the presence of the Lord is here with us as my witness. He, he's laying out something that's, that's solemn or that's serious. He says, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. You must no longer. You must, it sounds pretty declarative, pretty definitive to me. Would you agree? Would you agree? There's, I mean, I know we like wiggle room, but I'm not seeing a lot of wiggle room here. Am I right? Okay, again, I'm, 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 I didn't write this. I'm not making it up. I'm just telling you what the book says. It says you must no longer um, walk as the Gentiles do. Uh, here's what we understand about the Gentiles, that they were heathen. You even look in some versions, it just says as the heathen do, that you don't live as the heathen do. They didn't know God. They didn't obey God. They didn't love God. They weren't filled with the Holy Spirit. They didn't have a relationship with God. Uh, they, they didn't know God. And he says, look, if you're going to be in Christ, you no longer live like the heathens do. You don't live like you don't know. You don't live like there is no truth in you. Uh, he, he uses this metaphor of, of walking. You'll see it a lot if you've read through it, it, it will, through Ephesians with us several times this summer already. You'll remember in, in chapters 4, 5, and 6, there's that metaphor giving a, a, given a lot of, of our walk in Christ, our walk, the manner of our life, the, the, the way we live. You see 
see that in 4, 5, and 6. In, in 1 through 3, uh, chapters 1 through 3, you see a lot about who, who, who Christ is and what he's done for us. In 4, 5, 6, we see a lot more of this is now how you live because of who Christ is and what he's done for us. It's about how we, we live. So when you are a Christian, when you're a Christian, you're not supposed to walk like non-Christians. I, I, I've heard a little phrase in, in, in the recent years, it has kind of had some level of popularity. You know, the difference between a Christian and a, and a, is a, and a heathen is that the Christian is forgiven. True, but, but only a little part of the truth. Right? There's a whole lot more difference between a Christian and, and someone who doesn't know God. A whole lot more. I, I thought of a, a little, I don't know if you call it a book or just a little essay probably. It's by someone called Portia Nelson. Someone was trying to write it. It's, it's, um, they wanted to look it up. P-O-R-T-I-A, Nelson. It's called an autobiography in five short chapters. I, I, I saw this years ago. I think I used it in a message probably 10 years or, or more ago. I love this. I'm going to read you all five chapters. Okay, y'all ready? It's real short. I'm emphasis on five short chapters. Here we go, chapter one. And, and think of this. This is a metaphor, I believe, of the Christian life. It's, it's on this theme of walking. Here we go. I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I'm lost. I'm helpless. It isn't my fault. It takes me forever to find a way out. It's a life apart from Christ, right? I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place, but it isn't my fault, and it, takes me, it still takes me a long time to get out. Chapter 3. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it there. I still fall in. It's a habit. My eyes are opened. And, and I know where I am. It is my fault. I get out immediately. Amen. Chapter 4. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Chapter 5. Ready? I walk down a different street. <laughs> now what did I just say to you? I just said that for every one of us apart from Christ... We don't know how to live. We're going to fall into the pit. We're going to fall, and we don't know how to, 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 to make our life different, how to make things better. But as we uh, know who we are in Christ, we know what our identity is in Christ, we um, recognize that there are paths we don't even go down. There are streets we don't go down. There are just ways we don't live. The life of a Christian is definitely to be distinguished. It is distinguishable. It is different from the world around around them. And some of y'all, uh, I, I know where you can kind of go in your mind, well, I don't want to seem like goody two shoes. I don't want to just be that person who never seems like they have a good time. Look, if you are going to walk in your identity in Christ, you're going to recognize that there will be times when you're going to get picked on. There are going to be times when you get made fun of. There are going to be times when people will scorn you for certain positions you take or stands that you take in life. They may belittle you. They may shame you. They may even re reject you, but that is just the way it is for those who are in Christ. We are foreigners. We are strangers. Scripture says we are aliens in this world. We are not of this world, and nor should we feel at home in this world. We're, we're different. We are not of this world. So, so let's look at what does Paul say that this old us or this unregenerated life is? What, what is this person like? Get ready to fill in a few blanks, if you will. Here's the first one. The old you has a feudal mind. A feudal mind. Now, now I'm going to say some things that if you choose to take it this way, you could take, and you know I don't, uh, it's not my heart to do this. I'm not trying to offend anyone, but someone, sometimes in order for us to see how beautiful the light is and how wonderful it is what Christ has done for us, it is absolutely necessary for us to see who we are and what we are like apart from Christ. Um, it, it makes who we are in him uh, something that, that we, we just humbly 
just come before God and his goodness and his grace in our life and we say, God, why me? Why would you choose me to know you to have this life? So, so, so let's dig in. I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm going to give it to you straight. Are you ready? You ready? Buckle up. Somebody told me on the way out, I stepped on toes in the first service. So if you don't want your toes stepped on, get your toes out of the way. Because here it comes. You ready? Apart from Christ, our minds are, are futile. Now, now, some of you, again, would say that, that that's offen offensive, Pastor. If it's offensive, it's because we live in a world that, that always wants to hear, oh, you're so smart. Oh, you're always so insightful. Oh, you have such a great mind. You're just such a great thinker. But we have the Apostle Paul who kind of gets in the way of that thinking. And he says, well, actually, apart from Christ, your mind doesn't think God thoughts. Apart from Christ, your thinking is futile. A apart from Christ, your, your, your way of thinking and coming to conclusions, regardless of how smart it might sound, on your own you are earthbound and your thinking is limited. Your ability to think God's thoughts aren't there. So your, your decisions, your choices are temporary. They're, they're based in convenience. They're based in what before your eyes seems like the best thing, but they're not God's thoughts. Uh, given uh, left to ourselves, our thinking is futile. Uh, Romans 1, the apostle Paul talks about this again. And he speaks of a generation where God's wrath would be outpoured. And the, the outpouring of God's wrath was definitely against wickedness. But he talks about in that passage that what happened to the people was that they professed to be wise, but they became fools. We live in a world that professes a lot of wisdom, a lot of enlightenment, right? Don't we? Don't we? You should be very, very careful what you think is smart, what you think is bright, uh, what you think is, oh, that's such a great idea, that's such a great thing. We should be very, very careful as people of faith and people of God. Uh, Romans 1 again, professing to be wise, they became fools. What does it go on to say? They exchanged the truth about God for a lie, for something that wasn't true, and they ended up worshiping what was created rather than worshiping the Creator. We live in that world. And as people of faith, we must recognize either, either we are, 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 are giving into that and, and should question whether or not we are of faith at all, or we should recognize that we have an identity that is altogether different than that, that that is not who we are. So futile, futile mind, useless, uh, useless thinking. The second area that he brings out is darkened understanding. Darkened understanding. Everybody say it. Darkened understanding. Um, how many of you just, you don't like the dark? You don't like the dark. Raise your hand. Come on. This isn't a trick question. How many of you love the dark? You're just like really fond of it. Angela, for sleeping, is very, very fond of dark. I mean, blackout drapes, any light in the room, even the tiniest little speck of light coming from any device in the room, um, smoke detector to a to a electronic device she needs it to where she can't see it in the room if she wakes up in the middle of the night she might think it's an alien or something like that coming to take her away I'm not kidding it's true you're shaking your head you know it's true don't don't be a hypocrite right here in church you know it's true <laughs> if I'm lying you can straighten it out when you preach next dark darkness I, I'm not fond of um, of light either Either when I'm sleeping, I'm just not quite the same way about it. Darkness. We, we don't, in, in, the, in the natural terms, we don't like the idea of being in, in the dark. Yet Paul says here, their, their understanding is darkened. They, they can't see. And, and we have to be careful to guard against this, this even this kind of thinking being in, in, our, in our minds. I'm going to tell you how Christian handles where we see an invasion of, of the old us in, in just a minute. But uh, for the sake of, of, of moving on, let, let, let me tell you, you know, we have to guard because sometimes we'll say things like, well, you, you know, I, I know what the Bible says. I, I don't really see it like that. That's because your mind is, your, your understanding is darkened. That's what people say when they, when they can't see clearly. I, I just don't see it like that. The understanding is darkened. That's, that's why some people would say, well, I, I just don't 
believe that I have to be saved. I'm basically a good person. The issue is not whether or not a person is good or bad. It's not the issue at all. It's the, issue, the issue is that our minds are hostile toward God. Our minds are against God. Our, our minds not submitted to God are darkened. And I'll say it one more time and I'll move away from this thought. But I just, again, this morning as I was just going over my, my message, I, I just felt a couple of times the Holy Spirit just encouraged me to give you a warning. We live in a world where you must be very, very careful who's thinking that you're impressed with. Because there's a lot out there that, that, that projects itself as very wise, very smart, professing to be wise. It comes off in a way that, that is, is, is you just, how do you challenge that? It just makes so much sense. It's so right. Be careful who's thinking you're impressed with. I, I don't know who all that's for today, but maybe it has to do with finances. Maybe it has to do with parenting. Maybe it has to do with marriage. Whatever arena of your life where you're asking questions, where you're looking for answers, we go to God's word for answers. We go to God's word for truth. We, it doesn't mean we're always going to like what it says. It doesn't mean that we're always going to... to um, um, understand it immediately but we're going to go to god's word for our answers be careful what who's thinking you're impressed here's the third area um the old you is alienated and ignorant don't be offended by the word ignorant we all understand it doesn't mean stupid it just means we're unlearned in a certain area there are things we don't know that's why paul's getting ready to say that, that that's not how you learned Christ. You learned it. You, learned, you came to a revelation of Christ. But, but again, the old us is alienated and ignorant. Um, the, the old you was disconnected from God who made you. Um, the Amplified Bible says self-banished. You, you, you by your, by, by, through ignorance and alienation, removed yourself from God, who is the source of life, who is the source of light, who is the source of truth. You, you've alienated, alienated. It's, it means you're a citizen of a kingdom, but it's just another kingdom. And it's a kingdom that is at war with God. It, it is at war with God's kingdom. And apart from Christ, we are alienated from him. Here's an interesting thing that he says. He talks about the ignorance being because of a hard heart. Let's talk about a hard heart for a moment. Hardness of heart. The Bible talks about the heart a lot. Somewhere around 900 times the Bible's reference to heart is in about the organ in the body. But it is about kind of the center of who you are. What makes you, you? It has to do with mind, will, and emotions. Your mind, how you think, your will, how are you going to determine what you do? Your emotions, how are your feelings about things going to lead or, or govern in your life? The heart, mind, will, and emotions. So, so uh, uh, he talks about a heart, and scripture does about 900 times. L Understand that when our hearts are tender toward God, we, we say things like, I want to know the truth. I, I, I want to change. I want to learn. I want to grow. A hard heart says, no, I don't want to change. No, I want what I want. I, I want to think the way I want to think. Um, God, it's, I'm not interested in what you see. It's what I see that, that matters. So, so as a believer... You really have to begin at this point to ask your question, is my thinking more old me thinking or is my thinking more new me kind of a thinking? I'll circle back to that in a moment. The next thing that he mentions here is given, given up. He says it this way. Paul says, and have given themselves up. When I read the words given themselves up, I think of maybe a, a person in some sort of a war who surrenders, right? They gave themselves up, came out, hands up, I surrender. Can I tell you the posture of a believer's thinking is never to surrender to the old you. It, it, it's not an option. So, so I'm asking you, where have you given up? Where have you surrendered? Where have you said, well, I, I can't help it. I'm just going to think this way. 
Um, I, I'm going to justify myself in this area, Pastor. I, I'm, I feel vindicated in this area. I'll vindicate myself. I'll, I, just let me explain myself. And I know what God's Word says, but let me explain. Um, let me excuse myself. Where have you given up? Where have you given in? Is that kind of thinking you? And, and I'm not here to judge your heart. God knows your heart. I don't. But if that describes you, let me say something that might kind of settle a little bit harsh to your senses, but it's really what might feel like something you don't want to hear might be the very, very best thing you've heard in a long, long time. So I want you to hear me carefully here. If what I've been describing to this point describes you, once again, bad news, good news scenario, bad news may be that you may not even be a Christian. Again, I'm not here to judge your heart. But, but I want you to let God's word judge your heart. Um, how, how is there any good news in that? Well, you're in the right place today to be able to say, Lord, I don't want to be that person anymore. I surrender my life to you. Let me be crucified with Christ so that the old me no longer lives, but Christ in Christ I live. Christ lives in me. And the life, Lord, that I will lead from this day forward will be a life that you give me. The, the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. That we recognize there's a life in Christ. And can I tell you that whatever the Holy Spirit strips away inside of you if you were to come to that conclusion man based upon God's word here I don't know if I've if I'm if I'm really um, living out of the out of the new me if that person is really there uh, let me say again whatever is stripped away for that it's, it's it'd be a great joy in your life to, to let that go let it be a part of your past and say Lord from this day forward and let me assure you he's as close as the very mention of his name to you today if you'll call out to him, my Bible teaches me that those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. You shall be saved. You can surrender to him today and let all that old life go. But we cannot avoid the fact that everything that I've mentioned to this point that is the old you if you're a Christian and is, the, and is just you if you're a non He's writing to non-Christians. He's writing about it, the heathen life that they would live. The final thing I'll bring out here is that they, they, they don't like the, you don't like the truth. If, um, if the old you's dominating uh, people who are non-Christian, they don't like the truth. They don't like the truth. I, I believe this with all of my heart. Tell me if you agree. It's not that people many times don't know the truth. It's that they don't like the truth. You agree? Um, how many of you can say I'm guilty? Let's not point the finger out there. Let's just say right here. Uh, many times we know the truth, but it's that we don't like the truth. And it sounds so rebellious to say that, right? Um, I don't like the truth. So we'll say things instead like, well, I, I just don't know if I believe that. Popular in our world today is things like, well, I have a different ideology. Ideology. Oh, do you really? Okay. Impressive. Different ideology. Well, I just have a, I just have a different philosophy on life. Different spirituality. We hear that. We hear that, right? Just, 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 just diff different perspective. It's darkened thinking. It's, it's a futile mind. So, so here's the truth. It really doesn't matter what we think about ourselves. It really doesn't matter because the truth is that we're not going to die and stand before a mirror and give an account, give an account that has an eternal perspective to ourselves about ourselves. I mean, think, think about it. Just try to get that picture, and it's, it's kind of silly, isn't it? We step into eternity. We stand in front of a mirror. Okay, David, how do you think you did? Well, I think I was a pretty good person most of the time. Okay, good. You're good. No, we, we don't give an account to ourselves. We give an account to God one day. What he thinks matters. What he says is will really be all that matters in that day. Okay, so we've done the old you. Um, some of you are saying, where's the hope? Where's the happiness? Where's the joy, the encouragement in this? Well, we're going to get right now to the new you. But in order to do that, there, there's, there, we need to really, let, let's, some, let's build a bridge to it. The new you is the you in Christ. The old you, 
The, the, the goal here is not that the old you just gets self-improved. You say, well, I didn't think like that. Well, sure we do. I'm just going to try to do better. You know, I haven't been very good in that area, and I'm just going to try to be better in that area. No, no, the old you needs to die. Right? This is biblical language. This isn't my language. This is, this is Bible language. The old you needs to die. So when you see the areas where your old go-to would be, um, I'm just going to try to do better. I'm just going to pray the Lord. No, that, that, that old you is corrupted with evil desires, with, with uh, deceitful desires. You, you can't trust that old you to get better, but you can crucify the old you. Uh, the old you can be crucified. The old you um, can, um, can, can die. It doesn't need to get self-improved. So the new you is the you that we see in Christ. So, so here comes the hope. Here, here comes the hope. Uh, because we live in a world where everybody wants some kind of change. So there's so much self-help, self-improvement, self-actualization. Uh, it's all about self-esteem out there. Here's the truth. You can't change um, um, who you are, you can only change the things you do. You, you can only change what you do. You can't change who you are. But once you allow Christ, well, you allow God to come in and change who you are, that will begin to change what you do. Let's look at verses 20 through 24 again. L look at it with me one more time. But that is not the way you learned. Everybody say learned. Learn. We're learning Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in him. The truth is in Jesus. The truth is in, not in any conclusion I can come to. Um, it, it's, it's, it's in his word. It is Jesus. It is all about Jesus. That's not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him and um, the truth is in him. What is that truth that is in him? That truth that is in him is a truth that causes you to put away the old self which belongs to your former manner of life. It, it's a life that is corrupt through deceitful desires to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put away, uh, to put on the new self created in the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So the truth is in Jesus. What did Jesus say? I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. You weren't born a Christian. You weren't born with an innate knowledge of Jesus. You weren't born good enough. You didn't just figure this out. Someone has to teach you. And, 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 and so a Christian with humility just simply says, I don't know. And my speculation about this won't help. I need a revelation. I need a revelation through instruction. That's what will help me. And that truth is in Jesus. And anything that is not connected to Jesus is not ultimately the total truth. Here's the, here's the second thought. It's to put off the old self and its deceitful desires. Put off the old self. Hebrews 3, 12 and 13 says, Beware, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. That's why we can't trust our heart. Well, I'm just going to trust my heart. Bad idea. Bad idea. You should guard your heart. G guard your heart. Uh, uh, lest you, any of you uh, be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Exhort one another daily. B I think he was saying be in a small group. Be connected to the right people. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So apart from the Holy Spirit, our, desire, our desires are deceitful. You can't just follow your heart. Don't follow your heart, guard your heart. Do what God wants, not what you want. He says that your mind needs to be surrendered to him. He says that we're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, and mind. That our, our mind, Paul talks about taking thoughts captive. We're transformed by the renewing of our minds. And this is the result of the Holy Spirit uh, enabled effort in our life. It's not always easy, but daily we are surrendering. Daily we are loving God's thoughts. Daily we 
We are taking thoughts captive. We are being transformed daily, daily. The next thing we're to do is we're to put on the new self. I'm so thankful there's a new self to put on. I'm, aren't, you, aren't you glad that the old self doesn't just need to be self-improved? But there is a new person that we are in Christ Jesus. Colossians 3.10 says, And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Y'all, there, there's your identity. S- circle those words, new self. Uh, new self. Highlight it. Um, underline it, memorize that thought. There's a new self, there's a new person. We're not talking about self-help, self-improvement. Here we're talking about an old you that, that, that is crucified with Christ, not an old you that's just getting some new techniques and some new ways to manage the same problems that you used to have in life. The Bible doesn't use that kind of language. The kind of language the Bible uses is born again, regenerated, new creation, new person, new man, new life, new self, new you. You're genuinely new in Christ. Final thought today, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Man, that's all I need to know, right? I need to know that I'm new in Christ, that I am in Christ, that I have the righteousness of God. I have right standing with God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, for our sake, this is the only way we have any righteousness or holiness. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, what, we might become the righteousness of God. That we might, that's what we're clothed in. That's, that's who we are. I want every one of you tomorrow when you wake up in the morning and you start getting yourself ready and you clothe yourself for the day, I want you to remind yourself that you're clothed in Christ. I want you to remind yourself that, hey, because of Christ Jesus, I'm not guilty, I'm forgiven. Because of Christ Jesus, I'm not hated, I am loved. Because of Christ Jesus, I'm not far away, devil. Don't try to sell those goods to me anymore. I'm not far. I've been brought near to God. In Christ Jesus, I'm not alienated anymore. I've been reconciled to God. In Christ Jesus, God is not against me. God is for me. God's not angry with me. He loves me. I I don't need to pay God back. Jesus has already paid the price. I need to remember who Jesus is, remember what Jesus has done so that I can live out of my identity in him, the identity he's given me, clothed in his righteousness, surrounded by his his love, a real friendship with Jesus through the person and the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life. And from that place, I get to walk in a manner that is worthy of that relationship. Isn't that what we're all after? That's what the new you is after in Christ. So I close by saying, what's your identity? What's your identity? Is it, is it old you? Or is it new you? Be honest here. You need to be just brutally honest. Some of you, it's a brutal truth, right? I'm not judging you. I'm just telling you. If, you. if you think about it, between you and God, I talked about old you and new you. Is your life more characterized by old you or new you? Again, I don't think it's wrong at this point for you to think, you know, I'm so old thinking me based on what Paul said, I should question whether or not, and again, if you really think about this, I I don't want to belabor this too much, but I've thought about it a lot. What harm would there be for any person in this room to say, you know, based upon that, if, if that describes the heathen Gentile, the old me, the old you, Maybe I just need to start over, uh, repent of my sin, ask Christ in my life, and, and, and just invite him to, to allow me to live from the new creation that I am in Christ. You, you may have to just kind of write off a lot of religious activity in your life where you felt like maybe you'd earned something with God because of the good things that you've done, which isn't the way it works, right? Right? So maybe the word accomplishing its work in your life today would be to say, God, I'm not going to spend too much time there wallowing in this possibility. But God, if it's even possible, 
that I've never really been made new in Christ, if it's possible that I've never experienced regeneration, that my desires aren't, um, my, aren't right, and it's, from a, and it's from giving in to deceitful desires, and it's come from a callousness of heart and just rejecting the truth, what would be the harm in starting over today? None. None. Nothing lost. What's your identity? Are you who you were apart from Christ? Or are you today who you are in Christ? Finally, how do, we, how do we get there? We take the old identity off. We put the new identity on in Christ. Everything we've talked about in the weeks leading up to today in this series. I'm excited about next month. I think it's going to be another great month in the series. But let's deal with where the Lord has us today. Close your eyes with me. Are you in this service today and you'd say, Pastor, I, I want to just cut, cut through everything and just be willing to admit to myself that my thinking is more like how Paul describes the Gentiles as much as I don't want to admit it. And I, and, I, and I feel at times the callousness of heart. My heart's not tender toward God or sensitive toward God. I've wanted to show up at church, ease my conscience, do the right thing the best I could, but I've never wanted to surrender my life to truly be born again, to truly, to, to truly experience regeneration, to, to, to become a new person in Christ. If that's you today, and again, all, all religious jargon from the past set, set aside for a moment. You would say, I, I want to experience new life in Christ. I've heard you talk about it now for a month. I want that. Would you just slip up your hand high enough that I can see it? I'm not going to call you out. I want to embarrass you, but I want, to, I, want you, I want you to identify yourself. And I want to pray with you. Yes, 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 yes. Anybody else? Very quickly. Anybody I'm missing? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You just, you just want to know. You want to be sure. You want to be sure. You want to know that you know. Anybody else, very quickly, before I pray, I'm going to pray with you right now. Okay? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we, um, Lord, as Paul came solemnly before these verses and said, use the language of, I testify in the Lord. Lord, I come before you right now solemnly to lift up this beautiful family of people that, that is seated before me today. Lord, many of whom, some have raised their hands, others didn't have the courage, but they, they definitely have the question in their own heart or mind. Today, God, for every single person who has any question in their mind, Lord, would you help them to bring clarity through these verses today that they would come to a place where they would say, God, I don't want to have my heart hardened before you. God, I don't want to have a callousness toward um, the, the world or the things of the world or God, the way the Gentiles lived as heathen, totally apart from you. No relationship. They didn't know you, God. They, 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 God, I don't, want to, I don't want that to be me. I don't want to be characterized that way. God, would you come in right now? Lord, I surrender my old life to you. Someone needs to do that right now. God, I'm not looking for self-improvement in what you desire to crucify today. God, I surrender my heart to you. I surrender my future to you. God, I pray. Lord, that as I live to see my mind renewed, as I live to take every thought captive, as I live to love you with my mind, God, just as your word tells me to do, God, I surrender that old way of thinking to you, and I render it dead. I, I, I render it crucified in Christ Jesus. And Lord, I'm asking that across this room, Lord, that, that, that regeneration is taking place right now, Lord, as people repent and turn their back on, on wrong and on evil and on all of the things that we talked about today. And Lord, they say yes to you, yes to a new life, yes to knowing you, yes to a renewed mind, 
yes to a life that is lived with, with intentional purpose, God, in serving you and honoring you regardless of what anybody around us thinks, we will walk with you. God, let it be to your glory. Let our families be lived to your glory. God, let others look at, at, at our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven, God, because we have distinguished. We've allowed you to distinguish our lives, God, from the brokenness and the pain and the, and the utter despair of the world around us. Help us, Jesus. Help us to do that, that you would be glorified. And we thank you right now for what you've done in this moment. And it's in your name we, we seal it, Lord. We thank you. Amen. Amen.